industrial design to furniture and so on and so forth. Um, I think Mark is really one of the people who has, more than anyone else that I can think of, uh, been able to, in the last uh, 10 years or so, uh, cross the boundaries between these disciplines, working on a range of uh, projects of, of different scales, from, from architecture to uh, furniture to large-scale designs to uh, very small things for mass-produced companies. Mark, as you uh, know, is uh, one of the uh, most accomplished and influential designers of his generation. Uh, he has already worked across a wide range of disciplines to create everything from chairs, glassware, and bicycle to restaurants, a recording studio, and the interior of a private jet for clients based in Europe, North America, and Asia. He was born in uh, Sydney, Australia, and studied jewelry and sculpture uh, before moving um, towards uh, furniture design uh, in the mid-1980s. Uh, uh, he moved to Japan in early uh, 19, um, in late 80s, in 87, and between 87 and, and 91, worked there with uh, the company of, uh, of uh, Kurosaki, the Ide uh, company, and manufactured a number of pieces, such as the organ lounge, uh, the black hole table, and the felt chair. From the early 90s he, um, until uh, about three years ago, he worked in Paris, and uh, he was, during this period, uh, very much involved in a number of uh, uh, interior projects, a lot of restaurants. Many of you probably know uh, the Coast Restaurant, which has now just been turned into a MASH restaurant in the last uh, couple of weeks. But that was really one of the kind of key uh, projects uh, in, uh, in London of the, of the mid-1990s. Um, his uh, work has been exhibited in uh, numerous uh, galleries at the Museum of Modern Art, at the uh, Design Museum here in London, uh, as part of the Vitra collection, and uh, so on and so forth. Many uh, different, uh, different places. But as I said, in 1997, uh, Mark moved uh, to London, where he uh, set up uh, the Mark Newson Limited, um, and uh, since then, of course, the range and scope of, uh, of the projects that he's been involved uh, with have uh, expanded to both mass-produced elements as well as, for example, the design of this uh, Falcon 900B airplane that you have seen on the cover of our events list uh, last week. Uh, more recently, uh, his uh, design for the uh, Ford car company, the 021C, I think has been in the news. And uh, uh, one of the latest projects uh, is uh, working um, with the Russian Space Agency. So he's obviously moving even uh, to space, working with them. Please welcome Mark Newson. Uh, thank you very much. You should have just kept going. This is going to be much better than mine. Um, well. The, the title of my, of my talk was, uh, I think it was So Far or something, which kind of basically is just, um, it's just going to be about me really, because it's the only thing I can kind of talk about with any degree of certainty. So, um, and this is just everything that I've done so far, all of my work so far. Um, and I should say at this point that if, if you have any questions sort of, you know, during or especially afterwards, um, don't hesitate to to ask because it's really boring when people don't ask questions because you know often it's kind of the most interesting the most interesting um, you know time um, where do I go okay go. Huh. maybe it went to sleep Okay, we'll do it this way. Oh, no we won't. Sorry about this. Seems to be working. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Great. So, um, really early on in my career, I, um, for one reason or another, I, or maybe no reason actually, I kind of started designing chairs, making chairs, even when I was, um, even when I was 
studying to be a sculpt well you don't really study to be a sculptor I suppose but when I wanted to be a, an artist um, I'm not quite sure how I drifted into to wanting to make furniture but but I was always interested in making furniture um, and and when I was doing jewelry I I moved uh, I sort of studied jewel um, when I was studying sculpture I moved uh, I was studying jewelry simultaneously um, mainly because it, it it was able to to teach me how to uh, you know how to build things really I was always very interested in in um, in putting things together and actually physically making things you know with with my own hands I always felt that that was a very important part of um, subsequently discovered that that was a very important part of being a designer is actually physically knowing how to how to make things and put things together this was um, one of the first chairs that that I did that was well, actually wasn't one of the first chairs there was there was several before this but this was maybe the one that that got into the magazines fastest um, it's called the embryo chair and I did that as you can see in 1988 um, and uh, it, it's kind of, people refer to this thing as being very organic. I'm not quite sure if it is organic or not, but it is probably the first piece that, that illustrates a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of features, I guess, that, that kind of turned up in my work later on, you know, the kind of curved lines, um, but as well the kind of simplicity, the symmetry, um, use of bright colours this hole right here, kind of holes started to turn up in everything I did. And, and straight after that, I, uh, I was asked by a um, uh, company in Australia. These were, these were all done in Australia, by the way, before I, before I left Australia. And this was actually, you know, this was for an exhibition and I had to come up with a design in wood so this is it. Um, you know, you know, I'm, I'm really not uh, working with different materials for me is is part of the whole process of of, of being a designer. Um, you know, people often ask, you know, what what materials do you like to use? And to me, that seems like such a stupid question because materials are just ways of of, of you know, ways to help you sort of exploit or, or illustrate an idea. So you know, I really don't care whether it's wood or aluminium or you know, whatever carbon fiber or titanium. Conversely, you know, if if you're obliged to use a certain material, I think you know it should be kind of looked upon as a challenge. And this is, I mean, the interesting thing about this was that, like a lot of my my early work and 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 work now, um, I, I don't know how many people companies I, I um. Um, I approached to build this thing, but they all said that it was impossible. Probably had a lot to do with being in Australia, but um, you know, eventually I did find someone. But um, interestingly, that was also one of the ways that I could get my furniture into production. The, the last two pieces you've seen, I made myself. Uh, you know, I physically made you know editions of these pieces, and then uh, and then. You know, with the pieces that I'd made, I was then able to approach companies, um, companies in Japan, companies in Italy, and I actually physically had something to show them. Without that, I doubt very much whether they would have taken me seriously. More chairs. This is another thing um, that I did called the Orgon Lounge. And it was a sort of a, an extrapolation of the of the embryo chair, the first chair that you saw. Um, comes in all of these very very bright colours that I became kind of renowned for using. Um, and and it was kind of influenced by the whole sort of surf culture thing in Australia. And that, for me, certainly you know at that time in the 80s was was a pretty important influence. Not not because I was a surfer which I'm actually not very good at, but, um, but because it seemed a very kind of um, indigenous part of, of, of the Australian youth culture and something that they were kind of very good at. One of the few things, actually. I mean, I don't mean that in a sort of disparaging way, but 
but it, you know the kind of the whole surf thing spawned you know lim you know oodles of industries and you know it's become kind of huge multi-million dollar um, business now which it, it sort of wasn't then it was just kind of you know youth culture but that that certainly influenced me a lot and the bright colors and the use of neoprene and, and uh, textiles like that in sort of in the mid 80s because that was really all you could get in Australia at that time they weren't you know um, you know it wasn't like Italy where there was just you know places selling fantastic types of materials I mean it was sort of, you know, if you wanted bright orange, you had to use neoprene. Go. Again, um, I made, um, you know, th this chair, I built a series of these things myself, probably about a hundred or so. You know, everywhere I, I went around the world, I've left a sort of a trail of, of rubble, sort of, you know, junk. Because, you know, I managed to sort of set up temporary work, you know, make makeshift workshops wherever I was. Until, until I got things into, actually into production with people. This thing's now being made by a company called Capellini, but it was, before that it was made by Ide in Japan, and before that it was made by me. And it was just a very simple, um, you know, again, a sort of an extrapolation of that early, um, you know, that shape that I that I discovered with the embryo chair, but a much simplified form, a little bit, you know, sort of as if you'd take a shape and just bend a flat piece of, of paper into an, a, a kind of an improbable shape. And the same chair comes in, you know, loads of different colours in in um, fibreglass and in lots of different materials as well, such as rattan. And one of the great things about, um, you know, I guess my life so far has been the the ability to to be able to travel all around the world to to visit, you know. Um, different manufacturers in different places. You know, during the construction of this piece, I actually had to go and live in Thailand for about four months, which was kind of exciting. Well, I mean, it was not at the time, but it's kind of like boarding school. I mean, it seemed really boring at the time, but in retrospect, it was great. Um, more chairs for an Italian company called Moroso. This idea of the whole sort of, you know, crops up again. And uh, in this case, it was actually used as part of the cushion. So, you know, instead of actually having foam, you could sort of sit on this thing and the air was, you know, became actually part of the, you know, the, 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 the foam that you sat on. And all of these things that you see are, are actually in production still. That, you know, they're still able to be purchased in various places. There's been a whole, um, a lot of things that have since gone out of production, which I'm not going to bother to show you. You know, in the early 90s, I started to get, uh, I started to um, command a little more respect in, in the furniture industry where certain manufacturers would take um, a few more risks in terms of producing my pieces. Um, you know, I'd always been interested in mass production, contrary to, to, to the way I'd been perceived until then. People often thought that, you know, because my things were expensive and, and because there was very few of them that that's the way I wanted it to be but in fact it was not a decision on my part it was a decision on the part of the manufacturers um, I'd always loved the idea of mass production um, you know and, and, and really since the beginning of my career I've been sort of striving to to be able to work um, at, at that end of the industry not, not exclusively I, I like the idea of doing limited edition things as well but I feel it's really important for a designer to be able to, um, you know, to be to, to work successfully in the area of mass production, especially for financial reasons. Again, a, a chair which is uh, originally designed for a restaurant called Coast in London, um, that's now being produced in plastic. 
you know, and up until now, you've seen only stuff that's been manufactured in Italy. Uh, interestingly, you know, it, it will probably take this thing. I think they've been getting this into production for about five years. It was designed in about in 1995, as you can say, and it still is not in the shops yet. So, working with um, it, it's it's interesting. I, I won't say it's bad working with Italians, but but uh, it, it's interesting working with different nationalities and 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 kind of figuring out how how they work in different ways and some are good in some ways and some are you know good in other ways this was a chair I designed for a restaurant in Germany and this this is kind of cool this chair because that both of the pieces on each side they're totally symmetrical um, and in actual fact it's the same moulding so they make one piece and swap it around and use it on the other side. Um, m a lot of the furniture that I've done, and in fact a lot of the, the accessories and a lot of the, the, the sort of bits and pieces um, were made for restaurants. Certainly the furniture, even, even things like you know, objects that you'll see on the table um, have subsequently gone in, into production with companies like Alessi. But designing restaurants is, is almost always a, a useful way of, of, of getting things made and then getting things in front of manufacturers. This is another chair which is uh, in currently in production. Uh, sorry, in getting ready for production. It's actually not out yet. and a similar uh, piece of the same series. And this was about the, uh, one of the first interiors that I did in Tokyo in the late 80s. Um, and I was asked to design a bar in a very small, sort of long, shotgun-like space. Actually, it was a sushi bar, I think, before. But, you know, you can see the proportions are really kind of long and narrow, and it's completely sort of subterranean. And that was... Um, you know, the, the early interiors that I did were, on, were for almost no money. I think that the, 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 total, the budget for this place was probably like, you know, 20,000 pounds or something, which, which now seems completely ludicrous, but um, see, it was an awful lot of money for me in those days. And it's actually still there, strangely enough. Even, even more strangely because it's in Tokyo and things seem to tend to be even more, um, even less permanent there. These buttons are really slow. Again, these chairs that I've used. You know, often when I design sort of interiors, I, I'll use bits of furniture and, and objects that um, that I've used before in other places, and I just kind of rehash them in a, in a different way. In this case, the, you know, these chairs, there's just one sort of big pole that goes all the way through instead of the little individual legs. But there's sort of things that, that I did in this very first interior, like the, the floor, which is, um, you can't really see it very well here, but... Uh, oops. Back. Um, these, these, they're aluminium floor tiles, and they're actually laser-cut aluminium floor tiles. But that kind of geodesic pa floor pattern appeared in, I think, just about every interior that I've done, in different materials. In... Uh, in coast, it's in laser-cut oak, <laughs> and um, I subsequently did it in injection-molded plastic as well. This is um, Coast Restaurant, which, um, yeah, unfortunately, has <laughs> been re recently sort of demolished to make way for a mash. Um, and that was, I guess, probably one of the, uh, certainly until until that, uh, up until '95 was the most ambitious project that I'd that I'd worked on. Simply because of the scale and and you know the logistics involved in designing such a such a big space. Also because I really designed every little bit, you know, from the furniture to the light fittings to um, you know objects that appeared on the table. I mean, not a lot of the th not all of the things that I designed for this place ended up in the restaurant, but most of them subsequently made it into production. This is the downstairs part of Coast. The, the, the interesting thing about this restaurant, well, the interesting thing for me, 
was, uh, was, was how I tried to kind of, you know, I was never really that interested in designing, um, it's hard to say, I was never really that interested in designing spaces per se, I was just more interested in kind of playing with surfaces and, um, you know, creating environments. This this big thing here is is a, is a sort of a silo shaped thing that that in, that holds the um, the stairs, and it kind of blends into the floor, so it's one continuous surface. The lights are, you know, I, I could never find any interesting light fittings, so you know, rather than design light fittings, I thought I'd just create sort of undulations in the in the plaster surface of the restaurant to um, you know to hold pretty conventional light fittings. Oops. Yeah, sorry. Anyway, this downstairs you can you can't really see that. Well, maybe you can see. But you can you can see the way that the that silo thing blends into the floor and sort of pierces the the um the ground floor of the restaurant. Another restaurant in Germany. Oops. Kind of fast. Um again, you know, these are more accessories that I designed. These are the light fittings for that for that restaurant. This was a uh, detail from Machinaire in Manchester, which is a pretty big project as well. I think it was like four stories. Um, and through each of the four stories, there were these, th this round kind of tank, this giant thing kind of went through all four floors. And there was beer brewing equipment in each one, um, which, which, you know, each of these tanks were, were, were painted orange instead of like, you know, the normal cheesy copper. This is, um, you know, details of the upstairs restaurant. I've sort of skipped two floors, but I don't know where the pictures went. But you can still see that these orange tanks kind of like go through all four floors. Um, and from a really early age, I'd, I'd very I'd been completely um, obsessed with sort of time and time pieces. No, time pieces. I was never really obsessed with time. <laughs> Quite the opposite, actually. Um, but I always loved watches and I loved clocks. And this was one of the first, this is actually the first and only clock that I've ever made. It's, um, it was again made in a limited, a limited edition of about, uh, Ten pieces, I think, and I built them all myself. And it was also an early exp experiment in the use of carbon fiber. As I said, you know, the, the whole kind of surfboard thing in Australia was, was, you know, apart from the youth culture aspect, was was also, you know, interesting for me in terms of the technology. Um, you know, materials like fiberglass and carbon fiber were very easily accessible there. And everyone had big backyards, so you know the smell of the resin wouldn't really bother anyone. But this clock, um, th these two dots here, th this thing's about three feet in diameter, by the way. It's about almost a meter in diameter, so it's really big. But these dots are, are Teflon, and they're controlled by magnets on the back. So you don't actually see these dots moving around. They, they sort of move imperceptibly. You come back an hour later, and then they're in a sort of a completely different spot. So it, it's not really obvious that it's a timepiece at all. But it was kind of a fun experiment. Most of the stuff that I've done, that I did, you know, then, were, I look at each of them as experiments, sort of technical experiments, little sort of technical assignments that, that I set myself. Um, a couple of watches. In fact, I did these watches both before I, di before I did that clock. This was the very first one, the, the, the big, the one with the dots here. And that, that's kind of huge, actually. It's about as big as a tennis ball, and it was designed to be worn on the outside of, of clothes. And I always thought there must be, you know, a more interesting way of telling the time than, than using, you know, an hour and a minute hand. So I was kind of playing around with the, with, with, with the idea of using these dots that sort of, you know, rotated, one for the hours and one for the minutes. Um, you know, it proved, well, at least, uh, in my little workshop, a very difficult thing to do. But I, I made probably about um, 20 of those of those watches. I, I doubt that any of them are working at the moment. But these these dots, straight. You know, it was a really funny story. 
they used to work perfectly until you got into an airplane and at about sort of 20,000 feet these, this dot due to the pressurization would sort of pop off <laughs> and it happened to everyone that had one <laughs> you know and the worst thing about I can honestly say now the worst thing about being a designer is is um, when you actually get involved in the manufacturing of things it's an absolute <coughs> nightmare because things invariably break and fall apart and you're the first person they come to so I don't recommend getting into manufacturing but it's a good way to learn you know anyway after my failure with the dot idea I moved to hands <laughs> and uh, I've never looked back since I also sold lots more of those, those these little ones I lived in London for about one year in 1987 and uh, I made all of those in my bedroom <laughs> it was absolutely appalling and I think I sold them all here actually so in about 1993 um, well I had all these designs for watches and I had an exhibition in Germany in 1993 and I met this guy, this Swiss guy, who had a contact in the Swiss watch industry. Not a, not a very good contact, but it was kind of a contact. It was more than, was more than I had. So we had this idea that we'd, we'd get one of my designs and put it into production, which we did. And this was the watch. And uh, that little sort of collaboration turned into um, well, it sort of became the birth of the iPod Watch Company, which is a you know a company that I started with this guy, and I think we now manufacture. Um, and well, I've designed sort of half a dozen different designs for this company, and um, you know we sell in excess of three thousand watches a year all over the world. So I know I just said that you know getting involved in manufacturing is not a good idea, but <laughs> I sort of contradicted myself. But but if you're going to do it. Um, then I guess it uh, it pays to do it in a serious way. Um, and strangely, it's become quite a you know a profitable little business. Something that neither of us ever kind of thought would happen. And we get a lot of press and you know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And these are some of the designs. This is maybe the best known one. Um, you know, one of the reasons I was interested in what I've always been interested in watches is per perhaps a, a fascination with, with small objects. Um, not with small objects, because I like big objects too, but I'm, I'm interested in detail. Um, and I feel that you really can't get too, um, you know, I mean, you can never be too obsessed with detail. I mean, I feel it's just such an important aspect of of everything a designer does, and it's so important. And a watch is a great way of, of, of illustrating, a, you know, detail, basically. As well as there's a couple of little um, interesting technical features that, that I came up with on, on this watch. For example, that there's no there's no back on this watch. Everything goes in from the front which was something that the um, the guys in Switzerland who were making this thing had never kind of um, they'd never considered before for some bizarre reason and the way that the watch band closes I'd always thought that a watch band was a, was a kind of a forgotten part of a watch and I'd always thought that it could be so much better or so much more interesting Um, kind of got a little bit carried away with this one. It's got a lot of information on it, but it's, it's <laughs> which people rarely use. Although you could if you wanted to. I mean, it actually works. It's a pilot's watch, so it has this thing called a, f a flight uh, a flight calculator around the outside, which means you can calculate how much fuel you, you've got left and <laughs> you know useful stuff like that probably doesn't work for your car but um, and you know I'm sure pilots use this to pull air hostesses you know 
But uh, but it was a fun, you know, fun graphic exercise. And it's made of titanium. And more watches. You know, like kind of all different, you know, ones with alarms and chronographs and, you know, you name it. Expensive ones. Expensive ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're all made in Switzerland, you see. They can't be cheap. Go. Ooh. Um, and this is actually really going back because that's the very first interior that I did in Sydney. And I don't really have much to say about that, but it's, uh, yeah, God. Didn't even know that was there. It's that the shop certainly doesn't exist anymore. This was a shop in Frankfurt. Funny thing about this shop was that there were actually no walls. There, it was only windows all the way around. And um, so everything that I made is on wheels. Well, except the chair. But the change room is on wheels. So you can kind of go in there and walk around like a Dalek or something if you want. And the other cool thing about this shop was that the mirror where you where you change, you know, if you were trying on a jacket or something, was actually a one-way mirror that looked out onto the street. So you thought you were standing in front of a big mirror, but actually you were changing your jacket in front, or changing your clothes in front of hundreds of <laughs> hundreds of pedestrians outside. That didn't really last very long, but it was fun for a while. <laughs> and another interior in Berlin, in Germany. Uh, sort of early 90s. You know, these early interiors that I did were really so much uh, about taking a really crap space and just making it an okay space before you could even think about trying to design something interesting. Um, and they were almost always small. But, uh, and, you know, the budgets were tiny as well. But I've got this little floor again that you can see this sort of... Um, laser cut aluminium floor tiles and you know it was just a, it was a very simple shop actually there wasn't much stuff that needed to be sold here you know I, I don't mean that in a bad way but uh, the, the clothing rail was probably the single most interesting thing I think because um, what what was actually on sale here was knitwear so all of the garments were very big and sort of chunky and heavy so I came up with this sort of this idea, which would sort of naturally separate each of the, each of the, uh, each of the coat hangers. But there was a very funny story about this shop as well, because it got burgled one night and they stole the furniture and left all the clothes, <laughs> which is, which has happened to me a couple of times, in fact. Um, and for a while there, I started to get a little bit um, disillusioned. It was with you know designing interiors because of the limitations and the budgets and and the the people <laughs> and the clients and you know there are so many kind of parameters that you kind of had to work within so i had this um i had this idea because i was interested in production and i was you know working on increasingly more and more industrial design this animation is a little bit retarded it was done about 5 years ago so you know like every month it looks twice as bad <laughs> but but that was the that was the little animation that I used to it was the first time I used a little, an animation to sell a concept to a uh, to a client and it worked really well. Anyway, the idea is that I won't bore you with the whole thing. The idea is that I would design this shop off-site. Well, hang on, no, I, I, of course I designed it off-site. It was in my office. Um, it was built off-site. It was actually built in a in a, a factory in France that. Uh, manufactured giant plastic garbage bins. So, so you know, whenever the client wanted to build one of these shops, it was, he'd just have to kind of like order all of these bits and stick them in. So there was really little work that actually had to happen on site. You'd never have to engage builders or any, anybody like that. Um, and, and one entire shop could be delivered in a, in a shipping container, in a 20-foot shipping container. And because it was rotationally molded and totally industrially produced, it was incredibly cheap. In fact, so cheap that the, um, 
the, 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 the backer of the designer that used this actually gave it to a lot of the retailers. They didn't even have to buy it in some cases. And what you got in this kind of kit was as many of these slices as you wanted, the floor, which were these molded plastic tiles, rubber tiles, and these tracks. And it, the whole shop would sort of, you know, slide, would slide open and closed. And my original idea was at night time you'd kind of close this big box up and it would go to sleep and you'd come in in the morning and open it up and everything was in there. I think they ended up building about 30 of these around the world, mostly in Japan. It was a kind of an interesting combination of interior design and, and industrial design. And I had the opportunity to make all the furniture that went with it. I did a similar concept uh, shortly after that for Apple computers, which unfortunately never got, never got off the ground because that was at a point in time when they were just about to go bankrupt. Um, but it was even more ambitious in terms of what it, it tried to do in, in, in terms of um, you know, creating an interesting and cheap retail environment that could be rolled out really quickly um, in any kind of environment. And the good thing about this, this kind of concept was that you could build it anywhere. You could build it in an airport. You could build it in a, sh in a, in a, in a department store. You could use it for trade fairs and things like that. You could use it in any kind of uh, conceivable you know, application. And it wasn't, you know, because these things were, in, were rotationally molded, they were basically um, indestructible. One of the things about this Apple concept that I thought was pretty interesting was, you know, I was, I was because I don't know, like, you know, I'm, I don't know that much about computers. I know a little bit, but not, not, not as much as I should. Um, I was interested in kind of demystifying the way computers work and how they're all hooked up. Um, you know how you know how monitors are hooked up to printers and how printers are hooked up to whatever. So these floor tiles were uh, transparent. So you put these floor tiles, and actually the cables would all run underneath them. So you could actually kind of trace where the cable went from a printer to a to a CPU or something like that. And it goes on and on. And, uh, and then that factory that I got all this work for in France, who I, whose core business was actually making garbage bins, like sort of recycling bins, asked, asked me to actually you know, design a recycling bin. So that was that. Um, this is a project that I did that was designed for uh, the city of Sydney. And this, this didn't go ahead either. It was for a, a large French company called uh, JC Doco. Um, bus stops, as you can see. And this was one of the finest interior projects that I've done to date. It was a, a recording studio in, in Tokyo. Um, you know, before I was talking about working within parameters and, and you know, the limitations that sometimes that, that imposes on a, on a designer. In this case, it was actually a, a great thing that those parameters and the, and, the, and the rules that you had to kind of stick to in terms of creating an acoustically um, workable space proved to really help um, drive the design. Of course, I worked with acoustic engineers and acoustic architects to, to achieve the, you know, the right kind of acoustic results. But it was really interesting um, that those limitations proved to be really interesting to work with, just in terms of the shape of the place. You know, create working with walls that, that have to be that have to absorb sound, working with other walls that have to reflect sound, and trying to um, combine all of those surfaces to create a space where the where it created a sound that was that was unique to the space. It was kind of like a fingerprint for the space. 
which is what you know every recording studio has a unique sound which people you know people will go to certain studios to achieve a certain sound kind of going back in time again to one of my early experiments with carbon fiber this is a table black hole table it's called. I was kind of obsessed with space and science and things, still am. Um, these holes go all the way down, almost all the way down. My idea with this was that you could just, you know, if you had your table full of clutter and mess, you could just, if you had an important meeting, you could just like sweep it into these holes instantly, <laughs> you know. And it was made pretty much like a surfboard, this thing, actually. A lot of my early work used, the techniques that I used to build it were, were the techniques that guys that make surfboards use. Another table for Capellini, a more mass producible design. This is a table that was uh, that I did for a company called B&B in Italy. The basic idea with this is that it should be easy to transport so, you know, the, the, the whole thing, the whole table is held together by this kind of uh, urethane cord, which you sort of wrap around and it, it holds all the legs and the whole frame together. That's basically what keeps the whole thing stable. And you can take it apart and pull the legs off and stick it into a box. More objects for, I think, you know, a couple of Italian companies. More objects again. These little shapes that I kind of came up with, you know, turned up in, in you know, all sorts of weird places. This is, uh, like, a v um, my idea was to create a more mass producible version of, of that, um, of that table you saw before with the three legs, this is a, obviously a one-legged version, but the top comes off and you can sort of pile things in that hole and put the top back on so you don't have to look at all the junk. And this was another, uh, a sort of a, another flat pack idea, although this one was first. This was for a, uh, um, a French mail order company called Trois Suisse. And, uh, you know, all they, they asked me to, to design something but preferably something that would be easy to transport to people via a mail order catalog. So this thing packs pretty flat when it's undone and was relatively inexpensive when it was produced. Um, and since sort of early to mid 90s I've been working in the, in the packaging, packaging industry as well, primarily with um, cosmetic companies I've continued to work with various cosmetic companies, although the first collaboration was with Shiseido in Japan. I'm now working with other companies in France. Um, but I always found this a very interesting industry as well, and one that, that I thought could be improved upon. You know, because the objects were small, relatively inexpensive to produce. an ashtray for a Swedish company. This is a sort of a, a carafe jug thing which is designed to contain water for use with this alcoholic beverage in France. Um, that should be what well, was supposed to be in the shops, in, not in the shops, in the cafes in France sort of in October, November this year. I'm not quite sure if they're still on schedule, but that hopefully should be everywhere in France soon. In the last few years, I've been working with um, Alessi in Italy, who make, you know, as you probably all know what they do. Uh, some of the first things that, that I designed that have come into production have been this uh, soap dish. And most of the things I've done so far have been in plastic. 
Ooh, and this is a thing for another Italian company called Magis, and that's a dish rack. So you can kind of put your dishes in any way. And all of these things are getting, you know, I started moving more into the area of, of, of mass production and, and being able to industrialize products because they've been manufactured in plastic. Um, salt and pepper grinders for Alessi. They were actually designed for coast, but for one reason or another they never ended up in coast. I think they were too expensive. This is a door, a hook, sort of a clothing hook for, for Alessi, which is available in the shops. <laughs> All of this stuff is. and a coat hanger for that company that made the dish rack, which uses a pretty interesting type of technology called, uh, type of injection molding technology, which uses a, a gas. So it, it's a little bit like blow molding, but, but it's injection molding. It's a little more accurate. Bottle opener. There's not much to say about a bottle opener. Um, glasses. These glasses were originally designed for, for the, the private jet project that I did because, as you can see, the, the bottom is, uh, well, they have a, um, a much lower center of gravity, so they're not as likely to tip over. Um, and they're all made from the same mold, just cut off at different heights. So Italo were very happy about that. They only had to make one mold. And this was a light that I designed for a day. It was like way back, 87. This was my sort of homage to uh, Marcel Duchamp or, or, uh, or maybe even Castiglione, actually. It, it's a ready-made thing. This, this, little, this little light um, fixture at the top was a, was a, a commonly available light fixture in, in Tokyo. Um, so I just sort of stuck this thing on the end of a pole. And <laughs> E-Day in Japan have been selling them for about the last you know, well, 12 years. It's quite funny. Mm. And this is a light well, that I designed for a company called Floss, Italian light company. Is It's actually just one of these things. Um, and Floss being a really, you know, they're a along with Capellini, was one of the first it Italian companies that I started to work for. And at that time, well, it still is a very prestigious company, I guess, but at certainly at that time in my career, I was really kind of blown away to be able to, you know, to have been approached by these people. <laughs> Stopped. This is the second project that I've done for Floss, so it, it took well, it took six years between projects, quite a while. Um, and that's actually just come out right now. That's, uh, I think, a available, you know, in the next week or two. It's a, a torch. And this was a sort of a, an, an idea that I had that never never made it into production. Well, Capellini made a prototype of this thing, but no one could really, well, no one in Italy, unfortunately, could never really, none of the manufacturers down there could ever get their head around the idea of, of, of what it actually was. Well, it was a bed, but just about everyone I know, including myself, um, ha had been sleeping on a mattress for like, ever since I can remember. I don't know many people that have real beds. <laughs> um, so I came up with this idea to, to build a thing. It was kind of like a giant extrusion that went around your bed. So all you had to do was buy this. You didn't have to buy the mattress. You could just fit it around your gungy existing mattress. And sort of, there was this big sort of elastic that you kind of like strapped it all together with. Um, the idea didn't really catch on. <laughs> I will keep trying that. Another thing for this company called Magis in Italy, 
they asked me to design a door stopper. I never knew there was a much of a market for door stoppers, but apparently there is. They sell. <coughs> and then, kind of going back in time again, I keep kind of jumping around here. This is a thing called the Lockheed Lounge, which was a sculpture, really. It's, it's sort of halfway between a sculpture and a piece of furniture. It only kind of reminds you of a piece of furniture. It's not really a piece of furniture. Again, you know, as I said earlier, it was a little bit of a technical experiment that I'd set myself. I kind of had visualized this really beautiful, fluid, um, shiny shape, a, a little bit like a, like a blob of mercury. But I, I didn't know how to make it at the time. The only way I could think of doing it was by, you know, building this shape and kind of hammering out aluminium panels and kind of riveting them onto a, a shell, which is what I did. And it, it's why it looks like this. If, had I known how to build it without using rivets, I would gladly have done so. But this thing sort of went on to, um, sort of has a life of its own now, really. These things get sold in auctions for huge amounts of money, and um, I don't have one, which is disappointing. Um, yeah. And that was a piece that went with it. Both of these pieces were sort of, a, a, again, very uh, influenced by sort of more decorative, or, or you know, by the decorative arts, I should say, or or by pieces of craft. What I really wanted to do was stuff like that. But as I said, I didn't know how. And then when I came to England, I met these guys that built sports cars, um, n mostly Aston Martins. And Aston Martin sports cars were made in, and still are made, in a aluminium, but they're all made by hand. And they developed over you know, decades ways of, of, of working with sheet aluminium and, and turning it into very kind of like um, fluid shapes, being able to kind of roll it and bend it and, and weld it in ways that, you, that were kind of imperceptible. So I was completely kind of overjoyed when I met these guys and went off and designed some bits for them to make. And the amazing thing about the way these pieces are made is that they're completely hollow. The, the thickness of the aluminium is really very thin. It's maybe as thin as a, a, you know, a 10 pence piece. Um, and again, they've, they've, they've kind of taken taken on the status of, of, of pieces like the Lockheed Lounge in that you know, they're sold mostly to collectors and to museums and um, you know, they end up going for really you know, quite a lot of money. But it's, it, it was really these kinds of pieces that um, at least early on was, was where I was really able to, to experiment technically and where I was really able to kind of have fun. And these things kind of ended up influencing a lot of the other things that I did. And these are all pieces in the same series. There was about four pieces in that in the series of those things. They're basically all sold and all live in collections of museums and you know places all around the world. And this was an interesting project that I did at the Fondation Cartier in Paris. And they asked me to make an installation. Um, and that was kind of an interesting request because, you know, I was, I was pretty much known as a furniture, well, a designer at least. So I thought it would be kind of interesting to try and combine, you know, being a furniture designer or an industrial designer and, and but, but to somehow create an installation in the way that a sculptor would. So I got this idea to, to build this thing which is kind of, each of these is like a chair. It is a chair actually, they're upside down, but if you turn that up the other way you can sit in it and it's like a really nice kind of soft comfy chair. And you could bolt them all together and create this giant sort of geodesic dome. Um, and it's called Bucky. The thing was called Bucky. It wasn't named after Buckminster Fuller, actually. It was inspired more by the, um, 
the Buckminster Fullerene, which was a molecule that was actually inspired by Bucky. And it just happened that it looked, you know, really similar to this molecule. But this thing's kind of huge, it's like six meters high. But it wasn't a sphere. So then I got this idea to actually produce one that could be built into an entire sphere, like a more industrially produced version of the same thing. And this one can, theoretically. We've never actually built a sphere yet, but you know, they're all sitting there ready. And that's rotationally molded, so it's a much more industrial kind of process. And this was the private jet project that um, I worked on a couple of years ago now. Um, it's a, a business jet, basically, or a pleasure jet, <laughs> as the case may be. Worked on the livery and mostly the interior of this thing. It was a pretty fun project because um, I really had carte blanche to do whatever I wanted. And it doesn't really matter when you're working at, at that sort of, in that industry on a, you know, on such an expensive object. You can really do anything you want and it doesn't really alter their final cost at all. So if you want silver leather, you can have silver leather. Or if you want silk carpet, you can have silk carpet. It's kind of like, you know, the difference between, you know, two million one hundred thousand and two million fifty thousand. It's like no big deal. It's kind of it's kind of a mad industry. But quite fun. The best part was you get to go in it, of course. Sometimes. Not very often. And this was a project that was completed pretty recently. Started a long time ago, but completed pretty recently. Um, bicycle, as you can see. Oops. Um, the problem of a bicycle was really, it was very much an engineering, um, was, it was really a, a, yeah, it was engineering completely, 100%. What you've got are all of these things that, you know, it's kind of like joining the dots, basically. You've got a wheel, you can't really move the wheels. You've got this thing called the chain wheel. You've got the seat, you've got the, the handlebars. So I had to come up with a really interesting way, basically, of, of joining the dots. Um, and I'd been interested, having worked in the aviation industry and, and learned about certain technologies that existed, of, of trying to use those technologies in, in different areas. And that's one of the great things about working in, in, in a broad range of disciplines is that you can you can draw from experience that, that you would never have otherwise had access to. Um, for example, the frame is made of aluminium, but, but it's, it's, it's vacuum formed. And that's a process that was developed specifically for the, for the aerospace industry, and only, it, it had only been used in the, the aerospace industry, a little bit in, the, in the, uh, the car industry, the auto industry. Certainly been never used in, in the production of bicycles. So I was interested to exploit that technology, but also to create an interesting shape. Um, th that's kind of what I, what is what the result is. It's it's two vacuum formed um, shells, two vacuum formed pieces that are actually glued together. So on that frame there are no welds at all. So it's completely glued together, which is also quite an interesting um, technical feature. I mean, this is. Designing the bicycle is actually a really complex thing because if you look at just about every bicycle out there, they're all made of tubes, um, you know, of varying profiles and sections and various materials, but nonetheless, they're all made of tubes. And I, I knew that I didn't want to do that. It was also an interesting opportunity to, to work with, with other technologies that were, that were kind of emerging in the industry, such as this, um, this internal gear system internal gearing systems that existed before for a long time. But this one has, I think, 15 gears inside. Um, so you've got none of the kind of, you know, the, the derailer and all that stuff that kind of flops around on your bicycle. So it's a much, you know, it's just a much cleaner, a much cleaner thing. Also, the cables are in, all inside the frame. So you know, this is the only little bit of cable you see up here. There's two versions of this bike. There's a sort of a cheaper one, which this is, and a more expensive one, which is the one that was just on a minute ago. Um, the cheaper one is uh, is painted in 
photoluminescent paint. So it, when night falls, it sort of glows for a while. Because there's all this stuff when you design bikes, you've got to have a certain number of, a certain amount of reflectors and really boring things like that that look awful. So I had to think of a different way of making it be making it conspicuous. You still have to have all the boring reflectors on. <laughs> And then, a few years ago, I um, was approached by Ford to kind of collaborate on a project. They weren't really sure about what that project would be. In fact, I think they even suggested some sort of interior project, and I said, no, you know, it would be much more fun to do a car, <laughs> actually. They couldn't see the wood for the trees. But this is the result of, uh, of the collaboration. There was no set brief with this project. It was. Um, pretty much the brainchild of, of one guy. The collaboration was the brainchild of one guy in Ford by the name of Jay Mays, who's, who's a vice president. Um, and he, you know, we just sort of sat down and tried to figure out an interesting project to do. We decided it would be good if it was a car, um, and then tried to define what kind of car it would be. But the thing just sort of evolved, really. It was quite, quite a nice, spontaneous project, considering um, how serious an investment it was for, for them in many ways. Um, hmm. Can't think of anything to say about the car. Is there a sidelight? No, there's not. You're right. There could be. If it went into production, there would be. Um, no, you're right. So, this one had a like a sort of a souped-up escort engine. <laughs> um, that's not the official line, of course, but the important thing was that it had an engine and it drove. <laughs> yeah, most people think it's just a, you know. Well, they don't even think it has pedals. They think it's kind of just a mock-up. But, it, you know, 80% of the the deal with this project was actually making a real car that drove. And that totally changes the kind of dynamics of the project. But, yeah, you could put side lights on if you wanted to. You could have little sort of spots there, you know. I mean, there's like, you know... I mean, this concept car is nothing compared to most concept cars. Most concept cars don't even have four wheels. I mean, but this thing even had functions that, well, you know, <laughs> drawer on the back, <laughs> which apparently has found its way into production in some other car, disappointingly. Because, uh, but anyway, the whole. The interesting thing about this project for Ford was collaborating with somebody that wasn't a car designer. And often I get projects, um, th the people that approach me to do things have never worked with anybody outside of their industry before. Um, you know, Ford have actually 3,000 designers working for them, so it wasn't as if there was a shortage of designers. But certainly none of them would have approached the problem of designing a car the way I did, simply because I wasn't kind of indoctrinated um, in the same way. And, and as much as it was an interesting project for me, it was, it was an interesting project for the designers within Ford to, to witness how um, designers, you know, I assume all designers work like me, or industrial designers, um, but no one in the automotive, in automotive industry works like I do. Um, no designers that work for big corporations work like, work like I do. So it was really an eye-opening experience for them. One of the other interesting things about designing a car yourself is, apart from the fact that it's like designing 500 products at once, um, you know, most cars are designed by like you know at least 50 people. You know, so so a car is just like a big collection. It's a giant kind of mishmash of bits and pieces, and that's always something about just about every car that I've ever seen um, suffers from a lack of a lack of kind of continuity, a lack of consistency. And that was really one of the issues that I wanted to address when 
you know, when designing this car. You know, I wanted it to look kind of homogenous and like, you know, everything was meant to be, everything was designed to work with, you know, everything else. But, you know, in, in doing that, you, you had to kind of design everything. I mean, even the tires. The, you know, I mean, they're not, you know, like the tire tread, the profile of the tires, the wheels, I mean, every single little thing. And, the, you know, there was also an opportunity to experiment technically with um, things like the lights, which are obviously different to conventional lights, but they, um, they're LEDs, they're not, they're not, they're not lights that, that most cars use. And you'll see increasingly that cars will start to use LEDs. Um, the size of the car is absolutely tiny. It's it's smaller than anything Ford makes already by about I don't know four inches, by you know, ten centimeters. So even though it looks a little, it it looks small, but it it it, it looks bigger than it really is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not specific to car designers. I think it's you know it's in kind of any uh, any industry really where you know or any kind of large organisation where you've got you know dozens or or hundreds of designers working. Um, I guess automotive design is a, is a good illustration. Sneaker design might be another good illustration. But um, you know, car designers generally tend to study car design, and as soon as they finish designing, you know, studying car design, they get employed by car design companies, who are invariably are in really awful places, you know, like Detroit and, um, you know, awful parts of Germany, and you know, they're really in kind of unsavoury locations. So these poor designers, you know, don't end up having a huge amount of exposure to um, things that are kind of, uh, that I feel, I mean this is my personal opinion, they may, and, and it's it's also kind of terrible to generalise, but I think by and large it's too true. But, but you know, in terms of being indoctrinated, they, you know, the, the way the industry works is that, um, you know, everyone will work on a specific aspect of a project and then at some point it all kind of comes together and it may or may not work. And what was really interesting for them was that, that you know, I, I think of things in, in, you know, I think of this thing as a whole. You know, I think of the big picture and then kind of like start to kind of dissect it. They tend to kind of work in the opposite way. They sort of start with all the bits and then, you know, these bits kind of grow. And um, It was a really interesting experiment though. And I think one that, that um, a company like Ford really learned a lot from. Um, they learnt that a lot of the designers that witnessed me doing this project, I think, um, gained a lot of confidence in their own in their own ideas, in in their in their the way that they presented ideas and and, and that the ideas that they had. You know, the way that they work normally is just by producing reams and reams and reams of of sort of these beautifully um, presented sort of Pantone drawings. You know, with perfect highlights and. You know, I never learned how to draw, so I, you know, and luckily I never had. To, you know, I was in a very fortunate position where I never had to present those kinds of illustrations. If I had to do that, it would have never happened. Um, but it's a, it can be a very frustrating industry for them, and I think it just, it, you know, it showed that it 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 was possible. It, it is possible to design an entire car. I mean, from you know top to bottom. I don't. I don't think it's driven by consumer aspirations because I don't think consumers. You know, consumers kind of get force-fed. Yeah, but I don't. I know. I think market research is bullshit. A lot of people in, you know, oh, that's what that's what I think. You know, I know it's bullshit. Actually, <laughs> no. Um, but yeah, people do have a choice, but they can only choose from what 
from what exists. So, you know, to to a certain degree, um, you know, your your choice is is uh, is already decided for you. I mean, with regard to something like this going into production, um, you know, whether it's this or another car that's as kind of bold as this in terms of it being different, um, it, it is starting to happen. Actually, I think it is going to change. Yeah, I mean, large companies like Ford, for the first time, are approaching people like me. You know, this has never really happened in history. I mean, in the history of design. I mean, unless you go back to you know, people like Raymond Loewy. Um, you know, Stark's done it to you know. Stark sort of paved the way in, in a lot of areas, but but I think really design, you know, the area of design is is um, you know really for the first time in history kind of becoming very um, a really interesting place to be. Sorry, keep going here. The whole idea about this car was that. You know, the, the interior of the thing was like a bathtub, so nothing touched the sides. Like the seats all kind of hovered and were connected at a, cent a central point on the bottom. And, uh, you know, the floor was completely flat. The seats kind of moved in a variety of different ways. Even the instruments were sort of orientable. You know, there was a little toggle switch here where you could sort of point the instruments towards you or towards the passenger, which would be really useful. <laughs> um, and the actual, you know, the entire instrument panel wasn't connected to the car either. You know, I'd always thought that that was a nasty kind of inter collision of, of, of things on cars, you know, where the, the A-pillar comes down, hits the instrument panel, and, you know, you, ha you have some sort of interior surface, and it always looks ugly to me, so I thought the best way to try and deal with that was to kind of separate all of those things. Um, and the whole thing pivots, by the way. This whole instrument panel, these two buttons. You, you know, rather than, sometimes on on cars you see that the steering wheel moves, but on this car the entire you know the entire thing kind of rotated up and down. And on these sort of eight buttons, you could have just about every everything you needed, which is kind of an interesting exercise in itself. You know, most cars are just completely overrun with detail. superfluous and it was in another colour, it was in green as well and it was still called O21C O21C for, I mean as, as probably everybody knows is, uh, is the Pantone reference for a certain orange but it's also sort of 21st century so it's kind of a fun pun I think that's what you call it and I had this presentation last year at Fendi, so I got them to make some furry dice, which they kind of couldn't really get their head around. And they stuck this model in there, which was very unfortunate. But, um, and Prada, Miu Miu made some luggage especially for it, so it was quite neat. And this is the last thing that I have to show you. Um, I was commissioned by the sort of Olympic Committee, I guess you'd call it. It is the Olympic Committee in Sydney in Australia for the 2000 Olympics to do a sort of a lighting, um, a lighting event to coincide with the opening and closing of the, of the Olympic Games. And there were these four separate episodes that I, that I came up with. One was fire, so th these were sort of completely animated um, sequences that, that basically lit the whole thing. Uh, and so the, they basically just set the opera house on fire. And then it turned into water, so the whole thing became like a big swimming pool, kind of like a big David Hockney picture or something. And this ran throughout, this ran from uh, the opening of the Olympics till the closing of the Olympics. And it, it went into flames when the torch arrived, the, the Olympic relay, you know, went through this part of Sydney. Oh, that's it. Oop, stopped. Yep, finished. Any questions, please?
said that you've never really learned how to draw, and I find that quite fascinating because you're so prolific. And I was just uh, wondering if you can maybe explain your process your, a bit about, and how you communicate your process and your thoughts to the manufacturers. And when I say I, I don't know how to draw, I mean, I have my own way of drawing. It's right. sort of kind of like doodling. I don't... Do you sculpt your own? Um, you, I used to, but, but um, I work pretty uh, exclusively with computers these days. So, you know, the kind of, the computer's almost taken the place of, of, of the workshop for me. Um, it's kind of like a virtual workshop, you know, building things in virtual space rather than building them in reality. So the computer's become a very useful tool in that sense. But normally, I, you know, I draw, I draw on paper, you know. Uh, it's not that I don't draw, I draw a lot. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, I generally kind of go straight to working on a computer with somebody that knows what they're doing. <laughs> um, Mark, you'd mentioned before about how you find it really important to use your hands and have your hands on materials and physically sample materials. Mm -hmm. So. In working with a computer, how do you find that informs your designs? All I can say is that I'm really happy that I that I had the opportunity to work um, a lot with my hands and to build things with my hands. Perhaps it's a kind of generational thing that you know maybe if I was sort of coming up now, I, I'd be going straight from you know straight to working on a computer. Um, yeah, and it's you know I'd I'd love to be able to still you know, build models and, and, and you know, make things. Um, and I, I really, I do feel it's kind of unfortunate that I, that I don't do that. But as well, it's a question of time. Um, you know, when I did that, I had time to do that. You often can get really bogged down doing that um, when often it's, it's, you know, there are always people that can do it better than you, you know, professionals. Um, so that's ten, that, that's that's what I do now. But it's still important, you know. I think it's still important to learn how to do that. And you know, if 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 I was to sort of study again, I'd I'd probably I'd try and do it the same way. I'm pr I'm very wary of of um, of uh, the suggestion that you can create with a computer. I think it's very difficult. I mean, it's a great tool. But I wonder whether you could say something about um, how your office is organized because I mean you m work with a great many materials and um, obviously the range of commission and the range of materials requires a vast amount of expertise and I wonder whether you could um, tell us um, to what extent the expertise is best in-house and to what extent it's best out-house with the client or with the manufacturer. And also, uh, that's the second question. Um, Can I do I the first one first? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'll forget it. No. Uh, I mean, the second one is actually very, is very straightforward. Well, actually, it's not that straightforward, but it's very short. It's um, about the place of style in your work or sculpture, in what way does questions of style or form come into your work and when and how? Sorry, I, do you want me to? <laughs> Another no, one? No. Yeah. yeah. Um, in terms, of, in terms of, the, of expertise and how my office is structured and um, working on such a variety of projects, in in my office, you know, we we don't tend to have, you know, particular fields of 
of, of expertise. It's kind of like when these projects come along, um, you know, for example, there's no one, there's, you know, none of us uh, have studied aeronautical engineering or lighting design. Although, you know, it's safe to say that we, you know, we've had experience in, in, in those areas. Um, you know, with, with regard to myself, I mean, I find that it's just, uh, you know, part of, part of the, uh, the challenge of being a designer is, is working in all of those different areas. You know, that is what being a designer is, is learning about, is learning about technologies, is learning about processes. Um, because you know, at the end of the day, what have you got? You know, I mean, you've just, you know, I don't collect design, but you can acquire knowledge. You know, you can acquire expertise in in working in all these different areas. Um, and it's really, you know, it's really easy to learn about these things. Um, you know, when you work in the aviation industry, you you obviously do liaise with people who uh, know a lot more about it than you do, but you know, and, and our specialists, or, or in any different kind of area, or, or watchmaking, for example. Um, you know, I can't build a watch movement, but, you know, obviously I work with people that can. Um, so there's a kind of, you know, you don't need to kind of be an absolute expert about in, in every detail. But, you know, a, a lot of it's common sense, really, I think. And I honestly don't feel there's a big difference between um, you know, designing a watch and designing a car. For me, it's fundamentally the same process. Um, there's a lot more in common than, than not, I think. Does that kind of answer your question? I'm not sure. Um, yes, I, I think it would be also interesting to know what kind of staff do you okay. have and how many people, for example, in your office okay. do you have? What kind of background do they have? For example, do you, do you well have... Well, they're all here. I can, they can all instance. come up and tell you one by one. No. Um, there's, uh, at the moment, there's uh, nine people. Um, every computer um, experts, technicians, experts, you know, people that really know software back to front, graphic people. Um, architects, um, administrative, um, sort of secretarial. Uh, you know, it's a good kind of, a good broad range of <laughs> skills. <laughs> okay, I, should, I don't know. I, I don't know if I can be more specific, really. Um, let me think. Four girls, <laughs> like. Um, the rest are guys, I think. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not uh, making fun, but can you ask me some specific questions? More, sp you know. Uh, but I didn't answer your second one. Did I? I've forgotten it already. <laughs> I think there, there, there are a lot of questions that are very similar. And you, you might get these kinds of questions in a school of architecture. Yeah. Partly because of the fact that in the context of the school, for a lot of architects, it takes a long time mm -hmm. to see the relationship between a drawing, for example, and a building. Yeah, yeah. So we, the same way that you work, we work with models and things like this. But probably the assumption is that with, for example, ideas like prototyping or yes. making things in terms of full scale, you might have a shorter time lapse or ch shorter time period between your concept, initial concept, whether it is the drawing or the computer, and at least some form of realization of the final object. Whereas we, 90% of the time, might never get to yeah. this sort of... So there is a kind of anxiety on the part of a lot of people to find out more about process. Yeah. Because to not just to sort of know how the, the question about the office or the question about the relationship with the, with the auto industry is to find a little bit from the other way around. What are the repercussions, in a way, of working 
in this way where you can work with prototypes on the design. So I think the question of process, because you showed mm -hmm. a lot of the finished product, how you actually get to these things. What do you find about the way in which some things work, some things don't work? You, I think you alluded to some of these things, but I think generally people might like to know more about mm. this interrelationship between prototyping and the final design, processes of working yeah. and the final design, that kind of thing, because it, obviously I think these are going to be more and more crucial for architects, because I think they will be able to also utilize these tools and techniques more and more as we go. And yeah. also I think because the, the, the boundaries between different disciplines will get shorter and shorter. So I think that's, that's yeah. a little bit behind some of the yeah. questions about the organization of the office, because it suggests new formations that are different than yeah. many offices. Uh, yeah, um, I'm just wondering, you, you've done a lot of many different things, and um, what sort of project do you really want to do next, if you have the chance to? Well, I, I'm, I've always been fascinated with, uh, with space and sort of, you know, aeronautics and stuff like that. Um, so, so I think before long I'd, I'd like to start, well, actually I already am, sort of, but, um, you know, working with... Uh, um, space somehow, you know, designing things for sort of other environments that, that are not sort of terrestrial, you know. <laughs> it's kind of, it's a bit vague really, isn't it? But um, I'm not quite sure what, what it'll be exactly, but, but, that, but that's kind of what, what I'd love to do. You know, so I'm kind of finished with Earth really, you know, you know? <laughs> already. But that's a that's a dream, you know. It's kind of maybe working with NASA. Yeah, you know, NASA or, or the Russians, or you know, <laughs> it's not a big choice, really. You know, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, but, but exactly, yep, you got it. I mean, that 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 for me would be really one of the most exciting um, areas to work in at, at this point in time. It might be uh, related to computer art design or it might be related to style, but the, uh, the context is the link between architecture and product design. And a, uh, a little story in a sense is I have a friend who works for Honda in Japan and uh, designing their, their cars. And the whole studio, the whole office has actually been to Frank Gehry's Guggenheim Museum and have all throughout their studio images of that museum and look at that as one of the next sort of developing things in car design. So that's why I think, is it, you know, you're saying that you're being approached, you know, this new situation of an uh, outside designer. Yeah. Is it to do with uh, the means of, of manufacture in architecture being similar now to, to product design or is it a style or fashion? Yeah, no, I don't think it has anything to do with manufacture or, or production. If anything, I think the technology w technologies that you have available in, in industrial design, because you know things are smaller, and um, you know it's it's a completely different kind of type type of production. Um, but uh, you know, it's just that you know all of these things are kind of becoming inter interconnected now. You know that, that I've been to you know car studios, and it's true. You know the walls are sort of strewn with images of uh, of architecture and and indeed fashion. Um, Sport, you know, I mean, with sports wear, whatever, um, you know, people are obviously inspired by, you know, all different kinds of, of, of things beyond, I mean, they have to be in, in the area of, of automotive design, you know, that's, I think, I think they kind of feel in the automotive industry that, that they kind of suffer um, stylistically, so they have to look elsewhere to, to, get, to, to get inspiration. Thank you. Thank you. Is it okay? Thank you, yeah, it's great.